Okay, for us, numbers are, are a very important thing um, because, each, because every, numbers, letters, all of that represents something. The, the world that we live in, everything represents something. We're meant to, to get lessons from every single thing that, that we see and therefore from our numbers also. So just a fascinating, just some fascinating ideas when it comes to numbers. So we'll start with the number one. What does the number one represent? So the number one represents unity. It represents God. We know that we say that God is Hashem Echad. God is the one God. And what's fascinating is that we see this idea of unity throughout the, throughout the letter, the letter um, one. one. And not just, not because, just because the letter, we know that every letter represents something. Every letter has a number. So the letter Aleph represents, of course, one. So that is the number of unity. There's only one thing. And, and whatever there is, is it's, all, it's all contained inside of that one thing. And that is the ultimate in unity. But if you look at the letter Aleph and the way the letter Aleph is shaped, so the letter Aleph is really, when it's written in the Torah, is two Yuds and a Vav. The Vav is on its side, and then on the bottom is a Yud, and then on the top is a Yud which if you take the numerical value of two yuds and above, comes out to be 26. And why is 26 significant? Because that is yud hey vav hey. That's God's name. So in the very letter of Aleph, in the, in the shape of the letter Aleph, you see this concept of, of unity, of God's unity, to see this concept of, um, of godliness. We know that, that one is the source of everything. And that's, in fact, that, that tells us so much about God, that God is the source of everything to the extent that nothing in the world exists other than God. That's very briefly, and again, I could speak for hours on this, but that's, that's very briefly, that's what the number one, the letter Aleph tells us, that the, the, it, teaches us the, it teaches us the lesson of, um, the lesson of unity. Okay, what does Bayes teach us? So the letter Bayes, or the number, the number two, which is in addition, it's Aleph plus something, which teaches us the concept of duality, the concept of, of complexity or tension. Because when you have two things, so then they, are, they can stand opposite each other. We know that on the second day of creation, God split the waters of the world. He split the world into the upper waters and into the lower waters, which means that machlokas was created on that day. Tension was created on that day. Right? Disagreement and discord was created on that day. And that's why on that day, it doesn't say in the Torah, kitov. It doesn't say the words, and it was good, because it wasn't good, because there was, there was tension. Now, there's only one small problem. On the second day, when it says that there was, you know, an, an upper world and in a lower world, so there we say that there's, um, the, okay, so, so if I leave it at that, so we, we, we say that that's, that, that machlokas, that splitting, that wasn't a, that wasn't a good thing. Um, well, actually, th- th- there's a problem, because if you look at the fourth day, there was separation created on the fourth day also. Anybody know what separation was created on the fourth day? All the, the orbs were placed in the sky on the fourth day, which means that there was now, there was or and choshech, there was light and darkness. On the first day, there wasn't light and darkness in the sense that there wasn't, there wasn't light and then the absence of light which created darkness. But that, that began on the fourth day once God took the light and put it inside of the sun. And yet it says Kitov on that day. I mean, that's, that, that's the greatest division between light and dark. And it says that, but, but it still says Kitov, that it was good. On the first day, when God splits between the waters, so we said Machlokas was created, you can't say that it was good on that day. So we leave out the word Kitov. What's the difference? Difference is, is that on the, on the second day, what was the differentiation that was made it was between Mayim and Mayim, water and water. And when you differentiate between water and water, those are two things that are the same. When you differentiate between them, that's called machlokas. When two people are supposed to get along and they don't get along, that's a terrible machlokas. But when you have bein or lechoshech, when you have a differentiation between light and dark, and look, we even say this on Saturday night. We say, we bless God, and we bless Him. We bless God 
for making differentiations, for making differentiations between holy and mundane, making differentiations between light and dark. So why is it that that's considered a good thing? We bless God for that. Because that, you need a division. That's not called the machlekes. When you have something good and you have something bad, you have something yeah. positive and something negative, and you separate between the two of them, that's not called the machlokas. That's not called a disagreement. That's the way things have to be. We have to learn how to separate from certain things. But when bein mayim lemayim, between water and water, between two things that are alike and are the same, those don't need to be separated. So when there's a separation, that's called the machlokas. And that's what the number two represents. And, and I shouldn't say number two. Yes, the number two. That's what the number two, the letter base, the number two represents. That there is that there is a separation. What it also represents is an increase. That you have an aleph, and then you have a second thing. You have one, and now you have a second thing. You have two. The very roots of increase lie in the letter in the in the number two in the letter base. I always point this out because I think it's an incredible thing that we know that every word, every letter, as we're, as we're trying to develop, has an energy to it. It has an energy. So when God, when God used every single number and every single letter in his creation, that every, he put in an energy into everything that was created. Well, if you take a look at the letter bases, we say that's the energy of increase. Look at the word Baruch. The word Baruch which means to increase. That's what a bracha is. A bracha is an increase. When you have bracha in your life, you have increase in your life. When I give you a bracha, what I'm doing is I'm increasing your life. When you recognize God is that he blessed you, what you mean when you say that God blessed you is that God added to your life. Look at the letters of the word baruch. We know that there are ones, there are tens, and there are hundreds. In the ones, the letter that's chosen for the word of increase and blessing is a base. In the tens, the letter that's chosen to represent the tens in increase is a chaf. A chaf is 20. It's, it's double. It's an increase of 10. And then in the hundreds, the letter that is chosen to represent increase is a resh. It's 200. So the very letters of the word baruch speak of the concept of baruch which is an addition and an increase. Bez, Reish, Chaf. One, uh, two, excuse me, 20 and 200. Rabbi, aren't they out of order? In other words, the, 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 fact that it's, the fact that it's out of order, I always, I always like to look at it and say that the, the reason whenever you see things that are out of order, it means that when, whenever you see things like in positive ways that are out of order, it means that you have to hunt for them. And that's why, that, that's why they're out of order because they're they're there, but very often you know, sometimes you'll find you'll find these kinds of um, uh, these kinds of gematria things. You'll find them backwards, and the reason why we find them backwards is because you have to look for them. And when you look for them, of course you're going to find them, but 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 you have to. They're not just apparent. They're not just in front of your eyes. You have to you have to search for them. You know there there is another famous um, famous concept like this. If you look at the word MS, what does MS mean? Truth. Right? So if you look at MS, what are the letters of MS? Aleph, Mem, Tuf. So when something is true, it's, you can look at it and it's very clear. When, when, when you have truths in this world, so very often the truths in this world are apparent. Aleph, Mem, Tuf is the beginning of the alphabet, the middle of the alphabet, and the end of the alphabet. And it's, a very, it's very clear when you look at the Aleph base, you see the Aleph, you see the Mem, you see the Tuf. And it follows a pattern. You start the beginning, the middle, and the end. And that's what Emes is. Look at, by the way, it's also interesting that every letter in the word Emes has legs. The Aleph has two legs, the Mem has a base, and the Tuf has two legs. Because truth stands, truth endures. Now look at the word for a lie, Sheker. So you see that the shin comes to a point, the kuf comes to a point, one leg, the resh comes to a point, one leg, because sheker, lies, can't endure. Look at the end of the alphabet. Where is the word sheker? The, 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 not the last letter, but go in one from the last letter, and it's those three letters. It's kuf, resh, shin, but they're out of order. 
it's shin it's it's re, it's written shin kufresh but in the alphabet it's kufresh shin why is it out of order because sheker is never clear sheker is always jumbled the lie never really makes sense you just press a lie hard enough and you're going to see that it's that it's out of order you're going to see that it's just it's not true okay i just i'm just pointing that out because of the of the same the same idea that there's always a significance when letters are not, when, when, when there is a word where the letters mean something, but they're not in order, it's because it's teaching us another lesson. Okay, but let's go back to Bayes. So Bayes is, we said, was um, increase. Bayes is machlokas, which, by the way, those are not contradictions to each other, because sometimes you need to have machlokas in order to be able to have an increase. In other words, sometimes there needs to be a clear differentiation of your boundaries in order to be able to move forward. You remember two weeks ago in the parasha, there was a fellow by the name of Pinchas. And what did Pinchas do? He killed a, a man and a woman that were involved in, um, in illicit and immoral behavior. Now, if I were to ask you, whether that was that was an act of peace or that was an act of war, you would say that's an act of war. That was a pretty, that was a pretty nasty. I mean, I don't even think that you can make a movie of that because I think that it would get you, and you know, a seventeen plus rating, you know, or or, or an X rating. I mean, to to show because he didn't just kill them; he killed them by spearing them in the genitals. I mean, the whole thing was like so, so dramatic and and so difficult to to imagine. So what does God give him? God gives him you know an, an award. He gives him the national award of peace. The national award. That's when that's when Arafat got man of the year, right? It's as crazy as that. It's like, like what? You know, the, the man of peace. You'll find a very fascinating thing if you ever look inside of a Torah scroll. Now you'll never get this aliyah unless there isn't the Kohen and Shul because it's always the first. It's always the Kohen aliyah. But when the when the word shalom is written in the Torah. When God says, that I give Pinchas my brisi shalom, my covenant of peace, the letter vav in the word shalom is called the vav ketia. It's a split vav. Split vav. Now, you know in, in the Torah that if any letter has a little split in it, or a little ink lost, or you know a little crack, Torah is not kosher, whole Torah is not kosher. And here we're commanded to write the word shalom with a vav ketia with a split vav, as if there are two vavs. Can you imagine that? Like the top of the vav, you know, you get the top and then, the, you know, part of the stem down, and then there's a diagonal little, you know, a diagonal line that ends it, and then you start the rest of the vav. It's very dramatic. I remember when I was a kid, once, when I was, I was just by mitzvah, and I was leaning, and they came across that I thought the Torah was puzzle. I had no idea what, you know, Vav Ketia, and I, my, my teacher didn't teach it to me. So I called the rabbi over, and, and he looked at it, and, and he said, oh my gosh, like, maybe it's not kosher. Yeah, the rabbi was no, was no genius and was certainly no, um, no Talmudic scholar. Um, he was an interesting man, but that's for another time. But anyway, he looked at it, and he thought it was puzzle until somebody else said, uh, that's the way it's supposed to be written. It's written with a vav ketia, with a split vav. Why is it written with a split vav? What do you think? Because there are two ways to make shalom. There's two ways to make whole. One way to make whole is by taking the parts and putting them together. One way to make whole is by cutting the pieces away from each other, by taking out the cancer, by taking out the, the negative thing, by identifying the negative thing, isolating it, and then the rest of the organism can continue on. Pinchas wasn't, Aaron was the kind that took the pieces and joined them together. He was an Oiv Shalom, a Rod of Shalom. Pinchas was the kind that separated. He was the kind that was able to identify the negativity and then get rid of the negativity. And that's, that's what a base does. Sometimes the way that we, we create, the way that we increase, the way that we, that we create peace is by putting things together, by adding. Sometimes the way you have to make peace, they have to make something whole, is by identifying what needs to be removed and by separating between the, the parts and the pieces. Okay, there's another thing with base that we say that Aleph is the source and Bayes is that which comes from the source. 
So the, if, if, you, if you look in the Talmud, every single tractate in the Talmud starts on page two. Every single page in the Talmud. There is no page one in the Talmud. Isn't that amazing? When you look at the numbering system, it's the first page is Bayes Ahmed Aleph, Bayes Folio A. And the reason is, is because Aleph is the source. That's God. Now I have God. Now we increase. We go to Bayes. Now we add to it. And that's the oral Torah. That's the rest of the Torah. If you take a look also, the Torah itself begins with a Bayes. God, wouldn't you have thought that God would have chosen that the first letter to start the Torah would have been an Aleph? Take a look at the Ten Commandments. What's the first word in the Ten Commandments? Yeah, in English, it's not going to work. Yeah, I am the Lord your God. What's the first letter of that word? I am the Lord your God, Aleph. So God, God started the Torah with an Aleph. He wasn't afraid of starting the Torah with an Aleph. Why not start the, the whole Torah itself, the Pentateuch? Why not start that with an Aleph? Why start it with a base? Because what's the first thing you need to know when you, start, when you, when you approach the Torah? God. Before you even start touching Torah, you need to know that there is a basis for all of this, that this is God's plan for the world. There's an Aleph. There is a source. There is unity. There is an absolute existence that exists in the world, and now you can start to deal with it. Now comes the base. Okay, one other important thing to know about the number two is that when you see two things, two things have an ability to be able to keep things in. They can, they can create some kind of, um, of, of boundary and barrier. We talk about the period of time that we're in right now is called Bain Ham Mitzarim, between the straits. And it's between two things. It's between the 17th of Tammuz and the 9th of Av. And then we're contained inside of that. But we're not held inside of that. Because when you have two things, it's like a getter, it's like a, like a fence. So those two things have the ability to be able to contain things inside of them, but they can't hold things inside of them. Because you can always escape from the from the top or the bottom. Okay. Then we turn to the number three. Very often in our davening, you find things repeated three times. We find the number three as the basis of everything we do. We find the number three, al shlosha dvarma olamomet, on three things the world stands. On Torah, Avoda, Gemilus Chasadim. We say that we daven three times a day, Shachras, Mincha, Mariv. We say that there are three mitzvahs that have os, that have signs. We say that there are three holidays, Pesach, Shavuos, Sukkot. On Shabbos, we eat three meals on Shabbos. And I could go on and on and on we find that the number three is really the axis of the world. And the reason is, is because what the number three teaches us, if one is unity, two is duality, discord, three is harmony. Because what the number three does is that it takes two extremes and it brings them together in the center. Avraham Yitzchak and Yaakov. Avraham is chesed, is kindness. Yitzchak is din, is justice. And then that comes together with Yaakov, who has both chesed and din. And it comes out called emes or tiferes. It comes out to be beauty or truth. I could go through every three and show you how it's two edges, two extremes that join together inside. We know that when we give praises to Hashem, the only praise we're allowed to give to God is El, is Gadol, Gibor, and Nora. 
We're not allowed to say any other words in the Shemona Esrei. You can't add to that at all. And if you do, and you're the Chazan, and you add words to it, so then the Mishnah says, Mishas can say, that we quiet you down, meaning that we pull you off with a, with a hook, and we, we make you sit down, you can't be the Chazan. Because there, there are three things that we say, two extremes again, and the center, God will give her but those three things contain everything inside of them. It is the smallest geometrical shape that is able to contain things. Two doesn't, as we said, doesn't contain anything. It can hold in, but it can't contain. Three contains. And that's why very often we will say things three times because what we're doing is we are, we are in, in with three, we're saying as if everything else is included. It's the ultimate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's really the basis of et cetera, et cetera, because it's, the, again, the smallest thing that holds things together. It also represents, and this is why the Maharal says, you'll find in Pirkei Avos, he said three things, right? We have, we, we have become very well learned in that, that you find threes all over the place. And the reason why you find threes all over the place is not only for this reason, but we go a step further, that threes represent the three basics of a human being. We are made up of guf, of nefesh, and of seichel. We are made up of body, we are made up of soul, and we are made up of intellect. And those, and the, very often, the three things that we're talking to, that we're talking to those three sections of a human being. Again, when we repeat things three times, it's because we are addressing three parts of our existence. You know, it's just very interesting that when you talk about, t- tonight's like, a, like a, a, a lot of little things about a lot of little things. You know, we talk about Shabbos. There are three meals on Shabbos. You ever wonder why there's three meals on Shabbos? You don't usually eat three meals. Well, I guess you do, breakfast, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But here it's, here it's three meals. Usually in the, in the Torah, we eat two meals. That's, that's considered the minimum. That's considered the normal, the normal meals of a day are two meals. So why three meals on Shabbos? So I'll tell you, the reason that we eat three meals on Shabbos is because when you celebrate Shabbos, you're celebrating three different holidays. So now you're thinking to yourself, uh, you're going to launch into some kind of philosophical thing. Okay, I'll take a little break. Now, listen carefully. I want you to notice this Shabbos, that you do something on Shabbos that is very different than any other day of the year. When you daven on Shabbos, the Shemona Esrei that you say Friday night is not the same Shemona Esrei that you say Shabbos morning. And the Shemona Esrei that you say Shabbos morning is not the same Shemona Esrei that you say by Mincha. Forget about Musaf. Musaf is always different. But if you look today, when you daven, where are you holding? It's nighttime ready. So you daven Mariv, you daven Shachas tomorrow morning, you daven Mincha tomorrow, you're going to say exactly the same Shemona Esrei. You're going to say that every single day of the year. On, on Yontif, you're going to say, Ata bechaton mikola amen, and you're going to say that for Mayriv, you're going to say it again for Shachris, and you're going to say it again for Mincha. You're going to say the same Shemona Esrei for Shachris, Mincha, Mayriv on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Shabbos, you say three different Shemona Esreis. You ever notice that? Why do you say three different Shemona Esrei on Shabbos? Okay, now this is a graduate level question, I understand. But what is the Shemona Esrei about on Friday night? I'm, I'm not hearing, Marilyn? Still muted. Creation. Creation. Kidashta, right? We talk about God sanctifying and creating the world. Friday night's all about creation, right? We talk about Vayichulu Hashemayim Ve'arzuchalot Zavam, right? We talk about creation. What's Shabbos morning about? Yismach Moshe b'Matnas Chelkei. Moshe was happy with the gift that he was given by God. What are we talking about? Torah. The old Shmon Esri is about Torah. What do we talk about by Mincha? 
I know this might be surprising, but we actually do that mincha. What 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 do we what what's the Shimon essay by mincha? Ato echad v'shimcha echad. You are one, and your name is one, and it talks about messianic times. So Friday night I'm dominant about creation. Shabbos morning I'm dominant about Torah. Shabbos afternoon I'm dominant about messianic about the messianic world. What's going on here? Why three Shimon essays? We never do that. It's always the same Shachas Mincha Marif because there are three holidays on Shabbos. The first aspect of Shabbos is Shabbos as the day that God created the world. The second is on the aspect of God creating the Jewish people. And when, when was the formation of the Jewish people, the completion of the formation of the Jewish people when we were given the Torah? And when were we given the Torah? On Shabbos. And when is the Jewish people going to be reconstituted for its eternal existence? That's going to be in Messianic times. And therefore, there are three aspects to Shabbos. There is Shabbos of creation. There is Shabbos of the Torah. And then there is Shabbos of Yom Shekulo Shabbat, the day which is going to be eternally Shabbat. And that is Olam Haba, the world to come. On Shabbos, we celebrate the holidays. We celebrate Friday night. We celebrate Shabbos morning. And we celebrate Shabbos afternoon. We celebrate creation. We celebrate Torah. We celebrate the, the, the future of Messianic times. Now this, by the way, is not Kabbalistic. This is brought down in the major halachic commentaries that there are three aspects to Shabbos. Okay. And that's why we dive in three different, three different Shman essays. By the way, Friday night's meal is called Su'uda Savra Mavinu. Shabbos morning's meal is called Su'uda Yitzchak. And Shabbos afternoon's meal is called Su'uda, the meal of Yaakov. This trilogy of Avram Yitzchak Yaakov, this, this trilogy of, of this theme of Torah Avodah Gemilus Chasadim, this theme of, um, of ourselves, of our relationship with God and our relationship with other people, this theme is woven into every single thing that we do. Okay, good. The number four. What does the number four teach us? The number four is, you know, there's, there's four corners on our garments onto which we affix tzitzis. There are four directions on the compass. Kabtsenu me arba kanfos arts, that we say that God is going to gather us in from the four corners of the world. Now, you know, those that the, the scientists would tell us there are no four corners of the world. Why is that the image that's being used that God will gather us into the four corners? Why do we put tzitzis on our four corners of our garments? Why do we have, um, why do we have four different directions? Which, by the way, do you know where those four different directions met? I'm, I mean, I'm asking because I'm setting you up for failure. I apologize. But, but, but do you know where the number four is? Well, yeah, some of this you'll know. Where is the number four woven in to our Jewish lives? Pesach, it's big time. Four species, certainly in the four. Say it again. Well, the four species in Sukkot and then Pesach. Four species in Sukkot. That's right. Lulav Esrig, um, Hadassim, and Aravis. Give me more. Haggadah. In the Haggadah. The Haggadah is like, it's, it just keeps smacking you in the face in the Haggadah. Right? Come on, give me some more basics. Lulav and Esrig. Four mothers. It. Four mothers. Say it again, Harvey. A shaking the lulav and esra, the direction. Going into going in, in every direction, correct? You know where the you know where else it, it appears? In your Shmona Esrei. Shmona Esrei. Okay, I'm not I'm not gonna put you, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna make, make you I'm not gonna put you in pain. You know where it appears in the Shmona Esrei? The Shmona Esrei is set up in four sections. The middle section of the Shmona Esrei is made up. Anybody know how many brachas? Middle of the Shemona Esrei. The request part of the Shemona Esrei. How many brachas? 
Okay, we'll do the math together. There's, there's 19 brachas. If there are 19 brachas, that means take off three that appear in the beginning of the Shemona Esrei, which in every Shemona Esrei. Take off three at the end, which appear in every Shemona Esrei. So that's six. I got 19. What do I have left? 13. 13. The middle brachos of the Shemona Esrei are 13 brachos. The way those middle brachos are set up, without a sitter in front of you, I'll just give it to you briefly and quickly, but the way it's set up is that the first three deal with personal, spiritual blessings. The second three deal with personal, material blessings. Then there is one blessing that talks about the ingathering of the exiles, which is the blessing where we transition from being individuals to being a community and worrying about the congregation of Israel. And then the next three blessings are in the, are communal spiritual blessings and then communal material blessings. Why is the Shemona Esri set up that way? Because that's the way the Jews traveled in the desert. We traveled in the desert. Three of our tribes were in the north. Three of our tribes were to the south. Three were to the east. And three were to the west. And why was that? Because every direction has a koach. It has a power. Every direction has an energy that God brings his blessing to the world through that direction. When we talk about the south, the east, the west, that we don't, we're not just talking about compass points, we're talking about a koach. When we wave our lulav and eserg on sukkis, we're not just saying, I believe that God is, you know, God is here, God is there, God is truly everywhere, right? That's not, that's not just what we're trying to accomplish by waving the lulav in every direction. What we're saying is that God bless me with the koach, with the power that comes from the north. Bless me with the power that comes from the east. Bless me with the power that comes from the west. Bless me the the power that comes from the south. When the tribes were laid out in in those compass directions, it's because the tribes that were laid out on the north had that nida, had that characteristic. They represented the koach of the north. The tribes that were on the south represented the koach of the south. Every single day in the temple, the Kohen Gadol, the priest, would go and he would take the blood from the daily sacrifice and he would sprinkle it on the Mizbeach, on the altar. And it would be placed on the altar in every direction of the compass. Because in essence, what we were saying to God is, is that the blood, which represents the nefesh ha'adam, it represents the existence of a person, the very life's breath of a person. Kidam hu nefesh because the blood is the life of a person, and that would be taken and applied to every direction to ask God to confer on our lives, to confer on our nefashos, the bracha that comes from each one of those directions. When we daven shmona esrei, we are offering the daily sacrifice. And when we offer the daily sacrifice, we are like the Kohen, the priest, walking around the Mizbeach, walking around the altar, applying the blood to the altar and asking God to confer upon us the blessing that comes from that direction. And therefore, we split the Shemona Esri into four sections, into four pieces. There are four compass points. It's the four parts of the Mizbeach that the priest encountered as he was offering the daily sacrifice. Because what, the, what the, the number four does is that the four contains in a symmetrical way, each side in a square is equal. And, and it, it, it's the, there, it's, it represents four independent forces coming together. It unifies in a way that three doesn't. And that's why when we talk about a home, we say, what is a home made up of? It's made up of four walls and, of course, a roof. But it's made up of four walls because what it does is, is that it contains everything inside of it 
and it is and it, and it, it radiates in a symmetrical unit inside of that unit. It's four independent forces coming together. Okay. The number Rabbi, are, are, the, um, are, the, are the strengths of the, the koach of the directions related in any way to the, those three brachas that go with each of the four parts? Or is that, are those, is, it, is the koach known? What, yes. Right? Yes. The, the, the personal spiritual, personal material, that is, the, that, that is representative of those directions. So one day, what, one day we'll go through that. We, and when you see this laid out, when you see the tribes and their koach, the brachos and their kochos, and and other things that we say about each direction, it's amazing how that all fits together. Okay. Holy cow! Really? I just looked at the clock. Time flies when you're having fun. Um, okay. The number, the number five, and I think. Uh, I didn't think this would take me two weeks. Okay, that's fine. Um, the the number five is five represents. Anybody have any idea what five represents? Five books. Of, five books of the Torah. F- that, okay, it is the five books of the Torah. But what is what does it represent? Vigor. Vigor. Okay. Keep going. Give me more. It's the hand. The hand, yeah. It's it's what, what it's it's something very very tangible. You can you can hold it in your hand. Okay. Also, arm. Say it one more time. Arms. 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 Okay. When the world when, when the world was created, anybody know what letter Olam as uh, this world was created with? Now, wait, the rational amongst you have to be thinking, what do you mean, what letter the world was created with? What, what does that mean? Well, it's a Pasuk. Ki biya Adonai tzur olamim. Ki biya, because with ya, which is God's name, Yudhei, Adonai, God, tzur olamim, created the worlds. Created the worlds. This world, the next world. How were they created? With Yah. Yud, Hey. The letter Yud, that's the upper world. The letter Hey, that's this world. Okay, I gotta stop here. I didn't I didn't even I didn't even scratch the hey. But but I'm giving you something to think about. And you know, you can do a little homework. Nowadays you don't really have to do much to do homework. I, there's two things you need to do to do homework. One is hey, not watch Netflix. And the other is staying in, it's, it, it's in the same place, but, but going to Google and typing, t- typing it into Google, Rabbeinu Google, right? All you got to do is you say to Google, Google, hey, and the creation of the world. The letter hey in the creation of the world. Type that into Google and see what you come up with. Next week, we'll talk about the hey, look at letter hey. Hey, hey. Vav, Zion, Ches, and Tes. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We've talked about. We'll just we'll, we'll have a line about ten, but just to tie the whole thing together. Okay, beautiful. And and I will believe netter. I will be hopefully be able to get to the Mishnah. The, the Mishnah actually is the short part of this whole of this whole thing. But these introductions are important, again, because we're going to be bumping into these numbers. So it's a good thing to have this understanding that, that numbers represent things. When you see numbers of things, there's a reason for those numbers. Okay, beautiful. We'll stop there. It is, as always, everyone. And uh, we will see you all next week. Thank you. We remember there's no there's no Sunday nights now. We we've we we put that on hold for a while. So there's no there's no Sunday night um, get togethers. Um there is still uh, obviously class on um, on Monday night and um next week Tishabov is on Wednesday night. So we uh, we should be fine for Monday night. Okay.
Have a Thank wonderful you. week, everyone. Okay. Have a good day. Thank, Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, where are we holding? Kuf Lamatet Bet. Ah, there we go. Okay. You remember how in shul, by, by Wednesday, by Tuesday or Wednesday, so the table that we learned at was, you know, it was, it was like a, a filled with bread. And, and anything I used, anything I used on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday was still sitting right in front of me. It worked fine when my table was massive, like, uh, you know, like it wasn't shul. But here my table was much, much smaller. By Tuesday, it's it's already it's like a jungle on my desk, Bar Hashem, you know, with all the with all the swarm because I'm I'm notorious for pulling them out and not putting them back right away. So usually Tuesday or Wednesday I end up having to spend time putting all the swarm back in my uh, in my thing. And when I sit in front of this um, th- this bookshelf as my background, so I look and I say, yeah, my bookshelf would never look like that. That's like a dead giveaway that it's a background. Okay. Have you got a green screen behind you? How did you I have do a green that? screen, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I thought I built, so. I, thought right. so. I built a green screen. By the way, your words today were really beautiful, eh? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Video settings. Good morning, Rabbi. Good evening, Rabbi. That's my green screen. It's a bunch of partitions, and I put uh, put, put green over it, green uh, green cloth, and works great. Because if you remember in the beginning, when I would when I would speak, you would see me like like you know you would lose me inside of the picture, but now it's perfect. And also, at least yeah, you can see this Hebrew writing. Yeah. Yeah, I've been having a good time with uh, with my backgrounds. Okay, um, so we learned in the Mishnah, So we said that you can put an egg inside of a masnanis. We said that a masnanis was a um, a strainer. So the Gemara brings a brisa that explains um, why there is no borer here. Tani Yaakov Karcha, Yaakov Karcha learned lefish ein osnasa elo legavin, legavin. Because um, it's really only done le gaven, which means that it should that, that it should the, the it should look good. In other words, um, the 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 stuff the 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 white of the egg um, stays on top, and the um, the yellow of the egg um, mixes in with the food, and is um, is and ne- nevertheless. It's not considered like borer of psolus of taking out the junk from um, the food because even the the chalmon, right, even the the, the um, yellow stuff that you are um, sifting out from the from the white. In other words, you're separating the yellow and the and the white of the egg. So then it's not really you're not really doing it to eat it, but you're you're putting that into the food really to color it. And it's and usually you're doing it into chardal, you're doing it into mustard, and that's the way you make the the color of the mustard. And if that's the case, so then both of them are equal. It's not really that one is considered ochel and one is considered psolas. Okay, itmar we learn. I'm sorry, just need another minute. 